जनाब जनरल एहसान साहब जो हमारे चीफ गेस्ट हैं आज के और जो जो इस सेमिनार को एक खास अहमियत देते हैं क्योंकि इनका तजर्बा है उस नौत का है कि जिन मौजू पर हम बात करेंगे उस पर इन्होंने डी जी आई एस आई की हैसियत से डी जी एम आई की हैसियत से और चेयरमैन जॉइंट चीफ स्टाफ के हैसियत से सब पे इनकी कड़ी नज़र रही है और इनका तजर्बा बहुत सालों का जो है वो अगर आपके साथ शेयर करेंगे तो हम मुझे यकीन है कि आप सब इससे बहुत इससे बहुत फ़ायदा उठा सकेंगे ना आई एम सॉरी आई एम गोइंग टू टू रिवर टू द लैंग्वेज एज नुसरत से दिस इज बाई लिंग सेशन सो I will speak in English. I will answer uh, if there are questions. I don't think we are going to have very much time for questions because you've got such a good collection of, of uh, brilliant speakers uh, that uh, I'm not sure that there will be time for uh, for questions uh, for very lengthy session of questions. And I'm sure that you will also find that the subject that we've chosen is a subject on which you will find a lot of repetition. There'll be repetition because most of uh, the pan panelists here are people who are experts in recognizing what our security challenges are, security challenges both internal and external, and our economic challenges, both internal and external. So you might find that a lot of things are repeated, and I therefore thought that I would take this opportunity to sort of pinpoint what are the issues. Give my views briefly, and then hope that these will be further elaborated upon uh, in the uh, discussions and in the uh, presentations made by my fellow panelists. Let me start with uh, the security challenges, both internal and external. I think uh, perhaps there is an interlinkage between the internal and the external. Uh, today, when I think in terms of our external security challenges. Three things stand out: our relations with Afghanistan and the advancement of reconciliation in Afghanistan. Second, the impact that this has on uh, the relationship with the United States and our reading or our interpretation of what the Americans intend doing further, both in Afghanistan and in the region. And thirdly, our relations with uh, India. from which also flows the fact that uh, and i will come to the relationship with china a little later because i wish to speak about that in the context of the china pakistan economic corridor but all these are also somewhat interlinked questions they are interlinked among themselves but they are also interlinked with our internal situation because the internal challenge the security challenge that we face is a continuing one it is one of uh, extremism and terrorism and the extent to which we have succeeded in curbing it is an important question that has to be addressed and how should we continue to address it is another element i think yes sir sir uh so my my uh, point about how we should address it is that internally we have reached a point i hope we reached a point where we can say that our battle against terrorism is succeeding but how should be how should it be fought further and i would like to venture the view that perhaps now the time has come when more of more and more of this operation must be construed as a as a as a police operation as a civil uh, matter in which the usual Uh, civil uh, law enforcing agencies plus the paramilitary forces under the control of the interior ministry must start taking more responsibility for this where with the ministries other uh, ministries there has to be a focus on reconstruction today we see and we have seen with some concern the degree to which there is unrest because the degree of uh, rehabilitation that is required has not taken place in the areas most badly affected by terrorism in the past in this by the same thing we must recognize that this internal problem has the external dimension that if the afghanistan crisis continues the unrest and turbulence that 
diminishing unrest and turbulence in the areas affected in Pakistan by terrorism, by extremism, will again rise to a new pitch if the Afghanistan situation is not settled. Therefore, one of the Im imperatives for Pakistan is going to be to look for how reconciliation could be promoted, how an Afghan-led, Afghan-owned uh, reconciliation comes out of the negotiations that uh, the U.S. envoy, Mr. Zalmi Khalilzad, is having uh, with uh, uh, the, uh, the Taliban, uh, and perhaps taking note of what happens in Moscow, what happened at the meetings that took place in Moscow, and having to draw a line as to whether this is helpful or, or harmful, and whether there may be the very grim prospect of a, of a resurrection of uh, the Northern Alliance and the, uh, the, the uh, civil war situation that existed between the Northern Alliance as it was then in 1996 and the Taliban. Will that be repeated in 2019? This is a situation that we must take every, make every effort to try and avoid. That is another segment of the external security challenge with its implications for our internal security that we must look at. Uh, we have uh, a problem in terms of the relationship with uh, uh, our neighbor, our close neighbor, close relationship with uh, Iran. Where does that stand and how does this fit into the picture that exists in, in uh, the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council, and the divisions within the Gulf Cooperation Council, the divisions which seem to suggest, or uh, to make it more immediate, the ministerial meeting that is going to be held in, in Poland, and on which the focus would appear to be uh, to see how uh, the alliance that uh, uh, the Americans are seeking to build in the, in, in the GCC and in the Arab countries against uh, uh, Iran, how that is going to come out. Now, of course, the ministerial has been reinterpreted or reassessed uh, or talked about as something that is aimed at peace in the Middle East, though uh, perhaps uh, many people will stay with the view that it, the inclination in the beginning was, is the inclination that would prevail. For Pakistan, this is a difficult situation, uh, a difficult situation which is compounded by the apprehensions and suspicions raised by the visit of uh, General Rahel Sharif, now the commander of the anti-terrorism or the counter-terrorism uh, uh, military alliance in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, with uh, headquarters in, in Riyadh, and what that has meant. I think that Pakistan has astutely handled the situation in the past and will continue to handle it in the future. Pakistan will not be drawn into any intra-Muslim quarrel. And that situation will prevail, whether it be a situation between Qatar and its erstwhile partners in the GCC, whether it be between the GCC countries and Iran, or whether it be the situation in Yemen. Pakistan will not be drawn. And I think that situation will continue to press home uh, in terms of how we maintain our relationship. But on the other hand, we have a very great dependence on the Gulf Cooperation Council countries, um, including all of them, there are, this is a principal source of remittances for Pakistan, and if there are principal, if there are now encouraging signs about remittances going up, much of this is happening because of uh, the current flow of remittances from, uh, uh, from the GCC countries. So we have to play a very careful game based on something that has been acknowledged as being Pakistan's position over the last 70 years. No involvement beyond an involvement in trying to have a problem resolved peacefully in any quarrel between two Muslim countries. Let me move to the other neighbor. Iran, I, I must now also say that I found somewhat mystifying the fact that our uh, inter-services gas uh, company has talked about the fact that they have asked the Iranians to tell them their view of whether uh, American sanctions will apply to the gas pipeline, uh, onshore gas pipeline, 
that we have been discussing with uh, Iran now for the last 20 years and uh, that they are still awaiting a reply. And yet, on the other hand, I saw a report that they wish to give a contract uh, or sign a, a memorandum with uh, uh, the Russian uh, Gazprom that they will build an offshore pipeline from Iran to Pakistan. I, I don't understand how you can reconcile these two. Uh, and this brings me to perhaps the question that I really want to address. Today we are listed as 117th in the list of corrupt countries. Bangladesh is listed at 141st, which means it is at least 34 places ahead of us in, in the degree of corruption. Bangladesh's uh, rate of growth today is 7%. Its uh, foreign exchange reserves are 30 billion plus. Uh, its economic trajectory appears to be on the upward swing. Much of it is due to the fact that they have greater market access and greater uh, freedom for garment making than uh, we do. But they also have control on their population. They also have now a better educational level. They have better health uh, uh, indices and in any way are better. Now, uh, we say that much of our problem arises from the fact that there is corruption. Of course there is corruption. What, uh, what I want to emphasize is that we are, according to people who study this, less corrupt than Bangladesh. So what is our problem? Our problem is governance. And this is the principal problem that Pakistan has to face. If our civil service is not restored, if we do not get back the quality of the bureaucrat which kept this country alive from 1947 to 51, 52, and then allowed it to progress dynamically during <laughs> Uh, a decade that we associate with uh, President Ayub and which had uh, many ups and downs and in which uh, in, in income inequality was talked about. But it was a period of, of progress. We were progressing then at 6.5% while we could talked about the Hindu rate of growth being 3%. Our rupee, 100 Pakistani rupees fetched 130 Indian rupees. Today uh, it's now 50 Indian rupees for 100 Pakistani rupees. Where has this come from? I think we come back to this, that you have to restore your governance. And the gov restoring the governance means taking measures for it. I have a formula, but better than my formula is perhaps a formula of uh, Dr. Ishra Tusan, who has studied this problem in great detail and who has laid out in numerous plans what exactly are the steps that need to be taken. My own version is rather simpler. My version is that in our civil service, you can talk about at least 30% of the people having the level of competence that is required. Give them the lead. And stop thinking of what has happened in the past as having been in the past. Do not have NAB involved in minor cases of corruption or minor or major cases of corruption which should be handled by the department, which should be handled by the, the anti-corruption uh, elements that you have in every institution. This is, this is the way to resolve them. And let NAB focus only on mega uh, corruption projects and slowly but surely rebuild. You have an advantage. The, your Prime Minister has a reputation for incorruptibility which has not been called into question. He has some uh, uh, advisors who are, whose, again, reputation is beyond reproach. These are the people around whom the rebuilding of the, the civil service can take place. But we must recognize that it is an urgent problem and that, that uh, the problem must be addressed with that degree of urgency. Let me come now to our other neighbors. We have, uh, in India, uh, we, our government has let it be known that they do not expect any forward movement until there has been, the elections are completed and either Prime Minister Modi returns to power or uh, uh, 
the Congress Party, which is rejuvenating itself, uh, becomes a, 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 a rival force, not by itself, but in alliance with other parties. My own feeling is that uh, today Kashmir remains the major problem between Pakistan and India. The Kashmiri people have now made it known uh, by their struggle, by their relentless, the youth appearing in the streets, taking bullets, taking injuries to their eye, eyes and other, uh, other limbs, uh, that they, they will continue their struggle. Their struggle is that, that of youth. It is not going to stop. The Kashmiri must therefore be a principal part of any uh, search for a solution. But in the meanwhile, we must keep an eye, as the Kashmiri people do, on the fact that Article 3870 of the Indian Constitution, of the uh, Indian Constitution in which the rights of the Kashmiris are uh, protected in small measure, and particularly uh, Article 35 of the Kashmiri Constitution, which prohibits the sale of any Kashmiri land to a non-Kashmiri, that these can continue to remain in force. These are the elements that we will have to watch. But I think we also have to see that for uh, Prime Minister Modi, so far, Hindutva, or the extreme view of the Hindu religion and its dominance, uh, has played a part in uh, his success. Is this going to continue to be the base for his success? Today on the Kumbh Mela, he has spent about $300 million in order to ensure uh, that uh, uh, the Hindu vote is, is for him. But my own, and this is uh, again my reading, not a reading that is necessarily shared, is that his, he will probably return to power, but with a reduced majority. And when he returns to power with a reduced majority, he will perhaps recognize that the extremist view that he has uh, propounded is not a view that will hold India together, but will polarize Indian society. And perhaps then one <coughs> consequence of this would be the willingness to not use Hindutva and not use the anti-Pakistan card uh, for the future. It's a hope. It's not, it's not a realizable hope. But it is important because one of the things that we hope for from the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, uh, which is what I want to talk about next, is that it must have connectivity. That Pakistan and Afghanistan must be the bridge between South Asia and Central Asia. It must be the bridge across which uh, Turkmenistan gas, uh, Tajik and Kyrgyz electricity uh, come to Pakistan or go on further as the Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India uh, gas pipeline is uh, 14 uh, planned to do and thereby create that measure of connectivity which is the economic future that we are looking for. We must remember that China, econo Pakistan economic corridor calls for Gwadar to have a capacity of 9 million tons. With each 9 million tons uh, I calculated, and somebody can correct me on this, this means more than 30,000 uh, 20 foot containers. That is a lot of traffic. It is, not, it is not the amount of traffic that you can expect from Kashgar alone. It is the traffic that will have to be generated from the region as a whole. So we are to use Gwadar uh, to its fullest capacity. It must be able to draw upon uh, the traffic that is generated throughout the region. And this, I think, is another lesson that I, uh, Prime Minister Imran Khan is willing to push for, that we have to look to our economic well-being. We have to look to how to improve the economic welfare of the, of the people of Pakistan. So that is, uh, I think, uh, let, me, let me, I think I've taken far too much time already, but let me stop here and uh, perhaps my colleagues at this table uh, will uh, enlarge on these points. But let me re-emphasize that our principal problem is governance. That is the first thing that we must seek to restore. And perhaps we must also restore, not uh, in the government alone, but in the people of Pakistan, a sense 
that the rule of law should prevail. You are sitting in Karachi. You are sitting on Sharai Faisal. We had for three days success in the special uh, sidewalk that had been created for uh, the the passage that had been created for motorcyclists. Three days. I I I go across uh, Sharai Faisal every day. It lasted for exactly three days. Then our people said, "Kya karna hai yar? Jahan chalo chalo. Kon kon rokta hai?" You had a, a helmet campaign for motorcyclists three days again, and it collapsed. Now I travel this and I see that there are still people sitting there trying to sell helmets. There are no buyers because there is no enforcement or law. And we have become used to the idea. We as a people have become used to the idea that sab chalta hai. Until that changes, until. we believe that the enforcement of law is is the duty of the law enforcing officers but it is also the duty of the citizen who when he goes to dubai is one of the most obedient one of the most disciplined uh, people going and yet as soon as he comes home he thinks that uh, I, i mean this is not what freedom means but this is how we seem to interpret our freedom that we can do what we please we do not have to follow any rules so let me leave you with this that there is a duty that has to be done by improving governance and improving the the instruments of governance but we also have a duty as a people to ensure that we do what is required to help the law enforcing agencies by not flouting but obeying the law